Hello, brothers and sisters. I am a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and as a personal challenge, I have decided to study all of the talks given by the Prophet President Russell M. Nelson since he became Prophet back in 2018. And as of now, he has 31 messages that he's given during conferences. And today I'm studying message number 19, Hear Him. And this was one that was given in the April 2020 conference. And I'm just going to go through, read some of it, and then give some of my thoughts and insights into what he's saying. Okay, the little synopsis at the top says, Our Father knows that when we are surrounded by uncertainty and fear, what will help us the very most is to hear his son. Okay, so he welcomes us all to conference. And then he says, in the past several weeks, most of us have experienced disruption in our personal lives. Earthquakes, fires, floods, plagues, and their aftermaths have disrupted routines and caused shortages of food, staples, and savings. So notice here, we are talking about a matter of weeks, as he says. Um, he is highlighting the natural disasters that have happened during that period of time, not even touching on the pandemic that has had a huge impact on those shortages. Um, so just keep in mind that this talk was given during the shutdown. And he says, amidst all of this, we commend you and thank you for choosing to hear the word of the Lord during this time of turmoil by joining with us for general conference. The increased darkness that accompanies tribulation makes the light of Jesus Christ shine even brighter. Just think of the good each of us can do during this time of global upheaval. Your love of and faith in the Savior may very well be the catalyst for someone to discover the restoration of the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, so the Lord can make turmoil and tragedy work for his purposes, and good can and usually does come out of difficulty. Okay, he continues on. In the past two years, Sister Nelson and I have met with thousands of you around the world. We have convened with you in outdoor arenas and in hotel ballrooms. In each location, I have felt that I was in the presence of the Lord's elect and that I was seeing the gathering of Israel occur before my eyes. And I think this is significant. Uh, much of President Nelson's focus throughout his life has been the gathering of Israel. And my personal opinion is that is because he is a prophet now. And during these last days, when the gathering of Israel and the return of the tribes will be a reality, and I think this topic has always resonated with him. Even since before becoming prophet, you'll see that a lot of his talks focus around this. And right now, it is clearly on his mind a lot. And the fact that he is saying that he feels like he is seeing it, or maybe at least catching glimpses of this, is huge. And probably means that we are not too far away from the time of those things becoming a reality. We live in a day that our forefathers have awaited with anxious expectation. Okay, that brings us to reference number one, which is Doctrine and Covenants 121, verse 27 says, which our forefathers have waited with anxious expectation to be revealed in the last times, which their minds were pointed to by the angels as held in reserve for the fullness of their glory. Okay, so he is saying that this is our day that we are living right now. He says, we have front row seats to witness live what the prophet Nephi saw only in vision, when the power of the Lamb of God would descend upon the covenant people of the Lord who were scattered upon all the face of the earth, and they were armed with righteousness and with power of God in great glory. And I think this statement here really amazed a lot of people because sometimes we read the scriptures and we know that we are supposed to liken them unto our lives, but sometimes it's hard to make those connections, or maybe we think that it's too bold to claim that something is talking directly about us in our time. But he is saying right here that this is us right now. Nephi is talking to you and is looking at exactly what you are looking at. The only difference is that you are physically here to see it. He is seeing it in a vision, but we are here witnessing it live. So if you read the chapter heading here of the chapter that he is specifically talking about, it says, an angel tells Nephi of the blessings and cursings to fall upon the Gentiles. There are only two churches, the church of the Lamb of God and the church of the devil. The saints of God in all nations are persecuted by the great and abominable church. The apostle John will write concerning the end of the world. 
So I would encourage you, if you haven't already, to read this chapter with that knowledge in mind. And he specifically highlighted verse 14, which says, And it came to pass that I, Nephi, beheld the power of the Lamb of God, that it descended upon the saints of the church of the Lamb, and upon the covenant people of the Lord, who were scattered upon all the face of the earth, and they were armed with righteousness and with the power of God in great glory. I think it really is helpful to, when we're pondering this, to read the whole chapter, to get some context about what this is talking about. And it might give us a general timeline as to where we are in relation to the end days and the second coming. You, my brothers and sisters, are among those men, women, and children whom Nephi saw. Think of that. Regardless of where you live or what circumstances, what your circumstances are, the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior. The God's prophet, Joseph Smith, is your prophet. He was foreordained before the foundation of the world to be the prophet of this last dispensation, when nothing shall be withheld from the saints. Revelation continues to flow from the Lord during this ongoing process of restoration. So Jesus is everyone's Savior, whether we recognize him as that or not, or whether each individual recognizes him as their individual Savior or not. And likewise, Joseph Smith is your prophet, the prophet of your dispensation, whether you recognize him as the prophet or not. Then he goes on to outline all that we have because of the restored gospel. Uh, We are sealed together as families. We are not only able to just feel the Spirit, but we have the gift of the Holy Ghost. It means we have access to priesthood power, which is God's power. No other church has these things. What an anchor to our souls are these truths, especially during these times when the tempest is raging. The Book of Mormon chronicles the classic rise and fall of two major civilizations. Their history demonstrates how easy it is for a majority of the people to forget God, reject warnings of God's prophets, and seek power, popularity, and pleasures of the flesh. Repeatedly, past prophets have declared great and marvelous things unto the people, which they did not believe. Then he talks about how these truths are not embraced by most people. He says, it is no different in our day. Through the years, great and marvelous things have been heard from dedicated pulpits across the earth. Yet most people do not embrace these truths, either because they do not know where to look for them, or because they are listening to those who do not have the whole truth, or because they have rejected truth in favor of worldly pursuits. Think about the parable of the sower. There are different reasons why different people don't embrace the truth. And don't embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ. The adversary is clever. For millennia, he has been making good look evil and evil look good. His messages tend to be loud, bold, and boastful. However, the messages from our Heavenly Father are strikingly different. He communicates simply, quietly, and with such stunning plainness that we cannot misunderstand him. Satan is very clever. He is very smart and very good at what he does. And that is not said out of admiration, but just out of truth and out of caution for us, because it's important to be aware of his tactics and to be aware of him and what he is doing in this world. He reuses the same tactics over and over, because every generation of time, he gets a whole new group of people to use them on. And people keep falling trapped to the same thing over and over again. Heavenly Father's messages are usually very simple and plain and easy to understand. His communication is usually very calm and quiet and not overly stimulating. Satan's messages and communication is usually loud and boastful and flashy and compelling and attractive to the natural man. They can sometimes be somewhat difficult to understand and something that seems new or exciting or sometimes that requires many hoops to jump through or mental gymnastics to even make sense of. So one example out of many that could be used here is the gender ideology of today. This is something that I've talked about a few times on on this channel because it is such a classic example of ways that Satan has confused the world. If he can get people to truly believe that women and men are no different from each other and are completely interchangeable, then that is a huge victory for Satan. Sadly, so many people are believing this lie. It is a complete deception from the adversary. 
You have to jump through many mental hoops for this to even make sense. And that is not to say that there aren't some people who really do struggle with a gender identity disorder. But that does not take away from the simple truth that a man's body has a man's spirit and a woman's body has a woman's spirit. This is simple. This is plain. This is easy to understand. A lot of Satan's tactics stem from the idea that morality is entirely relative. And what's right for me might not be right for you, and what's right for you might not be right for me. And no one can pass any form of judgment, or that's hateful. When in reality, there is objective right and wrong, and it's usually very plain and easy to see. For example, whenever he has introduced his only begotten son to mortals upon the earth, he has done so with remarkably few words. On the Mount of Transfiguration to Peter, James, and John, God said, This is my beloved son, hear him. His words to the Nephites in Ancient Bountiful were, Behold, my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased, in whom I have glorified my name, hear ye him. And to Joseph Smith, in that profound declaration that opened this dispensation, God simply said, This is my beloved son, hear him. So here we're getting into the heart of the subject of hearing him. And these three different examples from three different books of scriptures are all consistent in God's communication. Now, my beloved brothers and sisters, consider the fact that these three instances just mentioned, just before the father introduced his son, the people involved were in a state of fear and, to some degree, desperation. Our father knows that when we are surrounded by uncertainty and fear, what will help us the very most is to hear his son. Because when we seek to hear, truly hear his son, we will be guided to know what to do in any circumstance. As we seek to be disciples of Jesus Christ, our efforts to hear him need to be ever more intentional. It takes conscious and consistent effort to fill our daily lives with his words, his teaching, his truths. So the more we surround ourselves with influences that invite the Spirit, the more easy it is for us to hear his voice. And I've heard this analogy um, that the Spirit can be thought of as a Wi-Fi signal. And the closer we are to the router that kicks out that signal, the better our connection will be. We simply cannot rely upon information we bump into on social media. With billions of words online and in a marketing-saturated world, constantly infiltrated by noisy, nefarious efforts of the adversary, where can we go to hear him? So it gives us different ideas, different things we can do to boost our Wi-Fi signal. So number one, we can go to the scriptures. They teach us about Jesus Christ and his gospel, the magnitude of his atonement, and our Father's great plan of happiness and redemption. Daily immersion in the word of God is crucial for spiritual survival, especially in these days of increasing upheaval. As we feast on the words of Christ daily, the words of Christ will tell us how to respond to difficulties we never thought we would face. I feel like he's saying to us loud and clear right here, he's kind of giving us a foreshadow that things are going to be difficult for a while. There's going to be different forms of trials and upheavals all around the world that we're all going to face. Things that we never thought we would face. So we need to be daily immersed in the word of God so that we can strengthen the communication with the spirit and so that we can hear the voice of our savior more easily and more clearly. Okay, number two is that we can hear him in the temple. The house of the Lord is a house of learning and the Lord teaches in his own way. There each ordinance teaches about the savior. There we learn how to part the veil and communicate more clearly with heaven. There we learn how to rebuke the adversary and draw upon the Lord's priesthood power to strengthen us and those we love. How eager each of us should be to seek refuge there. And then he makes a note here saying that when worshiping in the temple is not possible. Um, I think he was specifically speaking about the closures, but I think this could apply to anybody who it's not possible for due to distance or health concerns. He says, I promise that as you increase your time in temple and family history work, you will increase your and improve your ability to hear him. So those same blessings can apply to anybody who is participating not only inside the temple, but also doing indexing, doing family history work. We can claim those blessings as well. And then number three, 
We also hear him more clearly as we refine our ability to recognize the whisperings of the Holy Ghost. It has never been more imperative to know how the Spirit speaks to you than right now. And if you remember, he said um, in the conference before that time is running out. And then he's saying this conference that it's never been more important to know how the Spirit speaks to you than right now. So there's definitely a sense of urgency. In the Godhead, the Holy Ghost is the messenger. He will bring thoughts to your mind, which the Father and Son want you to receive. So again, he's kind of like that Wi-Fi signal. He's the one transporting the, those thoughts and those ideas into our mind, given to us from our Father and from the Savior. He is the comforter. He will bring a feeling of peace to your heart. He testifies of truth and will confirm what is true as you hear and read the word of the Lord. Okay, and number four, we hear him as we heed the words of prophets, seers, and revelators. Ordained apostles of Jesus Christ always testify of him. They point the way as we make our way through the heart-wrenching maze of our mortal experiences. So they are the watchmen on the tower. They are the ones who are pointing us through the maze of our life and able to see things from a vantage point that we just can't see. Okay, in this next paragraph here, he gives us some promises. He says, What will happen as you more intentionally hear, hearken, and heed what the Savior has said and what he is saying now through his prophets? Okay, so here's the promises. I promise that you will be blessed with additional power to deal with temptation, struggles, and weaknesses. I promise miracles in your marriage, family relationships, and daily work. And I promise that your capacity to feel joy will increase even if turbulence increases in your life. Then he announces the proclamation and he says that they wanted something special to commemorate the first vision and thought of instead um, of erecting a monument, that it would be more meaningful and sacred to issue a proclamation. Okay, I'm going to read this proclamation. It says, we solemnly proclaim that God loves his children in every nation of the world. God the Father has given us the divine birth, the incomparable life, and the infinite atoning sacrifice of his beloved Son, Jesus Christ. By the power of the Father, Jesus rose again and gained the victory over death. He is our Savior, our Exemplar, and our Redeemer. Two hundred years ago, on a beautiful spring morning in 1820, young Joseph Smith, seeking to know which church to join, went into the woods to pray near his home in upstate New York, USA. He had questions regarding the salvation of his soul and trusted that God would direct him. In humility, we declare that in answer to his prayer, God the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ, appeared to Joseph and inaugurated the restitution of all things, as foretold in the Bible. In this vision, he learned that following the death of the original apostles, Christ's New Testament church was lost from the earth. Joseph would be instrumental in its return. We affirm that under the direction of the Father and the Son, heavenly messengers came to instruct Joseph and reestablish the Church of Jesus Christ. The resurrected John the Baptist restored the authority to baptize by immersion for the remission of sins. Three of the original twelve apostles, Peter, James, and John, restored the apostleship and the keys of the priesthood authority. Others came as well, including Elijah, who restored the authority to join families together forever in eternal relationships that transcend death. We further witness that Joseph Smith was given the gift and power of God to translate an ancient record, the Book of Mormon, another testament of Jesus Christ. Pages of this sacred text include an account of the personal ministry of Jesus Christ among people in the Western Hemisphere soon after his resurrection. It teaches of life's purpose and, the, and explains the doctrine of Christ, which is central to that purpose. As a companion scripture to the Bible, the Book of Mormon testifies that all human beings are sons and daughters of a loving Father in heaven, that he has a divine plan for our lives, and that his Son Jesus Christ speaks today as well as in days of old. We declare that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, organized on April 6, 1830, is Christ's New Testament Church restored. This church is anchored in the perfect life of its chief cornerstone, Jesus Christ, and in his infinite atonement and literal resurrection. Jesus Christ has once again called apostles and has given them priesthood authority. He invites all of us to come unto him and his church to receive the Holy Ghost, 
the ordinances of salvation, and to gain enduring joy. 200 years have now elapsed since the restoration was initiated by God, the Father, and His Son, Jesus Christ. Millions throughout the world have embraced a knowledge of these prophesied events. We gladly declare that the promised restoration goes forward through continuing revelation. The earth will never be the same, as God will gather together in one all things in Christ. With reverence and gratitude, we as his apostles invite all to know, as we do, that the heavens are open. We affirm that God is making known his will for his beloved sons and daughters. We testify that those who prayerfully study the message of the restoration and act in faith will be blessed to gain their own witness of its divinity and of its purpose to prepare the world for the second coming of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay, and that's the end of the proclamation. And he ends saying, um, again, touching on the second coming of uh, the Savior, Jesus Christ. So this, I've been keeping track, is the seventh time that he's brought that up during conference in those explicit words. And if you notice the second to last paragraph, he says, the earth will never be the same. And I think that that is an interesting and significant thing to say. Um, The world has changed so much and so quickly after the gospel was restored. Technology seemed to advance at a, a more rapid speed. Everything changed from agriculture to advancements in science and medicine to the ways that we fight wars to the ways that we travel and uh, all the luxuries that we have and how information is so easy to attain and readily available. From the time of the first vision to now, it's really a relatively short amount of time. Yet look how fast everything has changed. And I really feel that this is because the priesthood, God's priesthood is back on earth and the true church is back on earth. Okay, he closes by saying, I know that Joseph Smith is the foreordained prophet whom the Lord chose to open this last dispensation. Through him, the Lord's church was restored to the earth. Joseph sealed his testimony with his blood. How I love and honor him. God lives. Jesus is the Christ. His church has been restored. He and his father, our heavenly father, are watching over us. I so testify in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And I too want to add my testimony to that, that I know that the church has been restored. And I'm grateful to be able to be alive during this time, during this last dispensation, and to have the knowledge of the restored gospel. I'm grateful for how much it has blessed my life personally. I know it has the potential to bless everybody's life that will embrace it. And God loves all his children and wants all of us to hear him and hear the voice of our Savior. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.